Sorry I'm so predictable, Jeremiah felt, suddenly sure that he was the most boring person in the world. No wonder Hope preferred the loose cannon that was Parker. Hey, predictable can be nice sometimes, Hope said. In an unpredictable world, it's nice to know that a corned beef sandwich will always make you happy. You're what would make me happy, Parker thought. But of course he didn't say it. He just thanked Hope for taking his lunch order. Then chided himself for his weakness, for being a boring, predictable, corned beef on rye eating coward who never had the courage to speak his true feelings. He turned to his computer and fell back into the virtual world. He was having a lot more success there than he was in the real one. Half an hour later, Hope appeared in his doorway again. Hey, Parker and I are going to have some lunch in the break room. You want to join us? Sure, Jeremiah said. He couldn't help but feel like he was being invited as an afterthought, but he couldn't say no to any gathering that included Hope. They sat around the table in the break room. Jeremiah opened his plastic takeout box, corned beef sandwich, tortilla chips, and a pickle, his predictable favourite. Hey, did anybody watch Kingdom of Bones last night? Is that a, uh, yeah, that's like Game of Thrones, Kingdom of Bones. Um, Parker asked, <laughs> tearing off a chunk of his ro roast beef sandwich with his gigantic teeth. Jeremiah was reminded of a nature documentary he saw with lions tearing off big chunks of zebra with their huge fangs. He feared that Parker was the lion here and he was the zebra. It's on my DVR. I haven't watched it yet, so no spoilers, Jeremiah said. I don't watch that show. It's too violent for me, Hope said, delicately nibbling at a corner of her veggie wrap. She was a vegetarian because she said animals were friends, not food. Finding Nemo. Uh, Jeremiah admired her kind heart, not to mention her conviction and self-discipline. There's already too much violence in the world. I don't like to watch it simulated for entertainment. That was the thing about Hope, Jeremiah thought. She was a good person. She had principles. You're such a girl, Parker said in a tone that implied being a girl was a bad thing. I bet you watch romantic comedies instead. Hope gave a small, embarrassed-looking smile. Sometimes, yeah. Parker shook his head. I would rather have my eyes burned out with a hot poker than watch a single romantic comedy. Well, fortunately, sorry, well, fortunately, that's probably a choice that you, that will never come up in your life, Jeremiah said. Unless you date a girl who's super forceful about wanting you to watch romantic comedies, Hope said, laughing her burbling little laugh. Jeremiah felt a tingle of happiness. Right now, it felt like he and Hope were sharing a little joke at Parker's expense. Enjoying Hope's smiling face, he absentmindedly popped a chip into his mouth. And he was on fire. Or at least, his mouth was. It felt like someone had filled his mouth with boiling lava. His lips, his cheeks, his tongue burned with an intensity that made fat tears spring into his eyes and spill down his cheeks. <coughs> Jeremiah, what's wrong? You've turned all red, Hope said, getting up from the table to get closer to him. He wanted to say, hot, but his mouth was too much of an inferno to form words. Instead, he made a fanning gesture in front of his mouth, hoping it would explain his problem. He jumped up from the table, ran over to the sink and spat out whatever it was that turned his mouth into a volcano. He turned on the faucet, stuck his head under it and let the cold water flow into his scalded mouth. When he lifted up his head, gasping, he turned to see Parker laughing so hard he couldn't catch his breath. Parker? What did you do to him? Hope demanded. This time, she wasn't sharing in Parker's laughter. Oh, Parker said, holding his stomach. Oh, that was so good. Jeremiah filled a paper cup with water and drank it down. The fire in his mouth had died down somewhat, but it wasn't totally extinguished. It felt like there wasn't enough water in the world to cool him all the way down. What happened? Hope said. Hope asked, her tone testy. The deli was selling hot chips, Parker said, still short of breath from laughing. The kind people eat on a dare. I slipped one in with Jeremiah's regular tortilla chips. He doubled over in a, a fresh fit of giggles. Which may have been the greatest thing I've ever done in my life. Well, I doubt it was the greatest thing in Jeremiah's life, Hope said. Those things cause actual pain. I thought you said you were going to be on your best behaviour today, Parker. 
Well, I warned you that for me, best behaviour means something different than it does for other people, Parker said. You know, when I see an opportunity for fun, I take it. No regrets. And no pity either, Jeremiah thought. Hope stood at the refrigerator. She opened the freezer door and, and filled a paper cup with ice. Well, I think you owe Jeremiah an apology. You know my motto, no regrets and no apologies. Parker shrugged, getting up from the table. Once you start thinking about it, you'll realise how hilarious it was. Later, losers. He held up his finger and thumb in the shape of an L and strutted out of the break room. What a character. <laughs> Here, Hope said, holding out a paper cup to Jeremiah. Suck on some ice cubes, it'll help. Thanks, Jeremiah managed to say, but his voice sounded thick and strange. He felt like his lips and tongue were swelling. I usually think Parker's pranks are funny, Hope said, but this one went too far. I mean, what if you had an actual allergic reaction or something? I'm okay, Jeremiah said, not being entirely honest. Actually, while his mouth felt like it might never be okay again, there was something better than okay about the situation, uh, about the attention Hope was giving him. It felt like she was really noticing him, like she was taking his side over Parker's for once. Oh god, oh god, he's gonna make Parker prank him just so that he can get closer to Hope. That's what's gonna happen, I'm calling it. I'm calling it. He's gonna let himself get pranked, or he's gonna do stupid things just so that Hope would would, yeah. Oh my god, if that's where this is going, that's that's. Oh, are you sure? I mean, are you even gonna be able to work for the rest of the day? Hope's a bro, bro. Hope's bro. Hope's brow was knitted with concern. On her, even worry was cute. It was nice to know she cared. Oh, I'll be fine. Once I get into the game, I won't even notice I'm in the world. I like that about you, Hope said. I've often thought about putting a sign on your desk that says, Do not disturb. Genius at work. So Hope thought he was a genius? Jeremiah was pretty sure he was blushing. Or maybe it was just leftover heat from the chip. Oh, I don't know about that, he said. You're much better with people than I am. Hope smiled at him. Well, then we compliment each other, don't we? Now he knew he was blushing. I guess we do. Every Tuesday night, Jeremiah met his friends Matt and Ty to play team trivia at Leonardo's Pizza. It was Jeremiah's one regular social engagement. Jeremiah had met Matt- Wait, Matt! Oh no! If, if this is what I think it is, there's no way, right? There's no way. Computer science majors. It could be the same Matt. It could be the same Matt from In the Flesh. If it is, this is gonna blow my mind because it's also like a like a VR game story, and I don't see where animatronics would come into this apart from a digital world, just like in In the Flesh. Oh no. Okay. Jeremiah had met Matt and Ty in college, well, where they were all computer science majors who were obsessed with gaming. Back then, they would meet up in one of their dorm rooms and play for hours, fueled by soda and junk food. Most of the time, each of them was immersed in his own game on a laptop or console, though they traded enough banter back and forth that the experience was still social. When Jeremiah took a psychology class, he learned that when toddlers play in the same room but not together, it was called parallel play. It amused him that he and his friends were in college but still engaged in parallel play. There was no parallel play for them anymore. They were three full-grown men with grown-up jobs. Matt was married with a baby boy, and Ty was a and Ty had a steady girlfriend. I don't think Matt had a baby because they were they were like they were like, oh yeah, we're gonna have a baby, and that was like a foreshadow to the fact that he does actually, you know. Uh, <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it's the same amount or not, but I don't think it is. Still, the three of them managed to meet once a week to eat pizza and play trivia and joke around in pretty much the same goofy way they had back in college. Jeremiah walked into Leonardo's and scanned the dining room, which was decorated in what could only be called cheese pool Italian style, with framed photos of the, lear the learning, leaning tower of Pisa and the Colosseum, with and red and white checkered pa uh, plastic tablecloths. Matt and Ty already had a table and waved him over. 
Ty's looks hadn't changed a bit since college. He was still a boyish looking black guy wearing the same round gold framed glasses he had always worn. But marriage and fatherhood had caused Matt to gain what he jokingly called his baby weight. And there were dark circles under his eyes from, exha from exhaustion. He was genuinely starting to look like he could be someone's dad. <laughs> hey, Jay, Ty said, gesturing for Jeremiah to sit down. I was just telling Ty I don't know how much help I'm going to be at Team Trivia tonight, Matt said, yawning theatrically. Connor is teething, and I haven't slept for three nights. The joys of fatherhood, huh? Ty said, smiling. Matt didn't return the smile. Just you wait, buddy. Oh, I plan to wait, Ty said, as long as possible. Same. <laughs> they were interrupted by the arrival of their usual server, who gave them a quick glance and rattled off. Extra large pepperoni and mushroom and three diet sodas? And that's how you know we've been coming here too long, Ty said. After the server left, Ty turned to Jeremiah. So, how are things at your glamorous workplace? Both Matt and Ty had regular IT jobs with fairly boring businesses. They always playfully expressed jealousy that Jeremiah had landed a job in game development. Oh, okay, it's not the same Matt. Jeremiah thought it was a trade-off. Sure, he had the cooler sounding job, but unlike them, he was alone. No wife or girlfriend, no kids, not even a pet. It's not that glamorous, Jeremiah said. It feels like we're just barely keeping afloat in a tiny life raft. I hope this VR game is a big seller. It would be good for things to be on the upswing again. He thought of his day at work, the hidden hot chip, followed by Hope's protectiveness of him, and her saying that the two of them complimented each other. But I think things may be looking up with Hope. He, realized, he, eh, he relayed the whole story of his and Hope's interactions and followed it with, so what do you think? It sounds hopeful. Matt said, then laughed for far too long at his terrible pun. Ty rolled his eyes. Ignore Matt and his horrible dad jokes. I think it sounds like she definitely cares about you, man. She may not be totally into you yet, but the thing she said about you complimenting each other sounds promising. Why do you say promising when you can say hopeful? Matt said. I think you're so tired and you're punchy, Ty said to Matt. Don't you mean punchy? Matt was cracking himself up. As your sane friend, unlike this one, Ty said, uh, chucking Matt on the shoulder, I say you should ask her out. Yeah, but what if she says no? Jeremiah's stomach knotted in, an in anxiety. Well, that would suck, but at least you would have had the courage to ask her, Ty said. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. But what would the courage be worth? Especially if I have to see her at work every day after she turns me down. Jeremiah couldn't imagine the awkwardness. And then too, if Parker got wind of the fact that Hope had rejected Jeremiah, he would never let Jeremiah forget it. I can tell by the look on your face that you're worrying about problems you don't even have yet, Ty, asked. Ty said. Just ask her out. Matt began rhythmically pounding on the table and chanting, Ask her out! Ask her out! Ty joined him and Jeremiah, laughing, finally said he'd think about it but his friends only stopped pounding on their table when the pizza arrived. <laughs> Looking in the bathroom mirror, Jeremiah ran the razor over his foamy face. Today's the day, he told his reflection. I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna ask her out. He splashed warm water on his chin, dried off and combed his hair. He looked himself over, something he hardly ever did. Not bad, he decided. True, he wasn't slick or handsome like Parker, but there was also something about Parker's face that made it seem exceptionally punchable. Jeremiah at least looked at the nice guy. He was a nice guy, he told himself. He would be an excellent boyfriend if given the chance. He put on an extra coat of deodorant because he knew the anxiety would make him sweaty. He squirted toothpaste on his toothbrush and as he brushed, he remembered Matt and Ty's rhythmic chant as they pounded on the table at Leonardo's. Ask her out, ask her out. As he walked down the sidewalk to work, his feet pounded out the rhythm of their chant. Ask her out. Ask her out. You need to ask her as soon as possible, he lectured himself. Don't sit around all day trying to talk yourself into it. Just jump right in and ask. He took out his phone and texted Matt and Ty. I'm gonna ask her. Matt replied with a, go for it. Ty sent a thumbs up. Jeremiah smiled. He was ready. Oops.
On the elevator, he kept his fingers crossed that when he entered the office, he would find Hope alone so they could talk. But when the door slid open, he saw that he had no such luck. Oh good, he's here, Parker said. He was standing with Hope, who was looking heartbreakingly pretty in a Robin's egg blue blouse that somehow made her eyes look even bigger and browner. Both Parker and Hope were holding VR headsets. Hi guys, Jeremiah muttered, trying to hide his disappointment. Hey dude, Parker said. We were wondering if you could open up the testing room and get things running. I want to do a practice run on the game so far, and I, I, th I thought Hope could help me. It was the exact opposite of the situation Jeremiah had wished for. Basically, Parker was asking Jeremiah for the privilege of being sealed in a dark room alone with Hope. You want me to help out too? Jeremiah asked, fearing he already knew the answer. No, it would be better if you stayed out here and monitored things on the computer, you know? Parker said, grinning, his loathsome grin. I figure Hope will bring a fresh take on things. Since she's not actually working on the game development, she can experience it cold from a player's perspective. Right, right, Jeremiah said. Well, let me get things set up. He used his keycard to open the door to the practice room and then sat down in front of his computer. How could he have been feeling so good when he woke up this morning and yet feel so despondent now? Okay, Hopi, ready to have some fun? Parker asked, sounding like a demented game show host. Also, where did he get off calling her Hopi? Sounded like Dopey. He hated it. Sure. Hope said, giggling. They disappeared into the testing room, and Parker shut the door behind them. Jeremiah tried to concentrate on his work, but for once, he couldn't. He felt sick. Every couple of minutes, he heard a stray chuckle coming from the testing room, the intimate-sounding laughter that made his mind go places he didn't want it to go. Stop it, he ordered himself. They're playing the game, that's all. Of course they're laughing. People tend to laugh after a good jump scare. But then the what-ifs started. What if they're not playing the game? What if they're laughing because they're flirting with each other? What if it's more than flirting? What if his greasy mouth is pressed up against her petal-like lips? What if his slimy paw is stroking her wavy, lustrous hair? The more Jeremiah didn't want to picture these things, the more he saw them. I know the feeling, bro. I know the feeling. By the time Parker and Hope emerged laughing and disheveled, and disheveled, sorry, from the testing room, Jeremiah was a shaky, sweaty mess. You know what, he said. I may go on home, I think I've picked up a little bug or something. You look a little grey, Hope said, sounding concerned. I feel it, Jeremiah said. Wow, you must, Parker added. You never miss work. I know, Jeremiah was already on his feet and putting on his jacket, but I just can't be here. Well, rest up so you can be sure to come in tomorrow, Parker said. The last thing he saw before closing the door was Hope biting her lower lip like she did when she was excited about something. Oh boy. At home, Jeremiah put on his pyjamas and got into bed just as he would if he were really sick. But if he was really sick, but he was really sick, wasn't he? He was heart sick and that had to count. He would happily take a stomach bug or a bad cold over how he felt now. Lying in bed, Jeremiah couldn't imagine a time in his life when he, could, and when he wouldn't be alone. And then he remembered something that under the present circumstances made him even more miserable. Tomorrow was his birthday. As Jeremiah ploughed through his cereal without really tasting it, he decided the easiest thing to do would be to pretend it wasn't his birthday. Certainly nobody at the office would remember. Parker and Hope would probably be too busy canoodling in the dark testing room to even know he was there. If he just pretended this was another ordinary day at work, maybe he could avoid the nagging disappointment of a forgotten birthday. If he ignored it, if he ignored it first, he couldn't be that upset that other people were ignoring it too, right? Jeremiah's phone vibrated. He picked it up to see a text from his mum. Happy birthday! Wish I could be there for pancakes and presents. Gift card in the mail. As he was replying with a thanks and a heart emoji, memories of his childhood birthdays flooded back to him. Jeremiah had always been so excited to see what his birthday presents were that he couldn't wait without a feeling like he was going to explode. Finally, probably to save herself from spending a nerve-wracking day with an overexcited child, his mum had started the tradition of pancakes and presents. Since Jeremiah always woke up early on his birthday, 
who could sleep with all that excitement? His mum started the tradition of making him a big birthday breakfast. The cheesy scrambled eggs he liked, bacon, and a stack of bu buttermilk pancakes with a candle in them. What? <laughs> After he ate breakfast, he could open his presents. It had been a stroke of genius on his mum's part, really. That way, he had had all day to play with his new toys or games instead of spending the day pestering her about when he could tear into his gifts. On the evening of his birthday, Mum and Dad had always taken him and a friend of his choosing to Freddy's for pizza and games. Okay, so Freddy does exist in the real world in this. Jeremiah felt himself tearing up a little at the thought of those perfect birthdays of his past. There were no birthdays like childhood birthdays. After all that fun and fanfare, adult birthdays always felt disappointing. Maybe he should have gone out for pancakes this morning. He hadn't noticed it was raining until he stepped outside his apartment building. He cast a glance back inside. His umbrella was in his apartment, six floors up. It didn't seem worth the trouble to go back up and get it. He zipped up his jacket and walked in that strange, hunched way people walk when it's raining on them. On the elevator, he tried to mentally prepare himself for the scene he was going to walk into today. Would Hope and Parker be tittering over something at Parker's desk? Would they already be locked in the testing room? Would they announce their engagement? Don't get caught up in the drama, he told himself. Just do your job and go home. Maybe you can order takeout and watch a movie or something. When the elevator door slid open, Jeremiah was genuinely surprised by what he saw. The office was lit by strings of tiny fairy lights. A huge banner with balloons surrounding it said, Happy birthday, Jeremiah. He smiled. They had remembered. Or even better, she had remembered. But there was nobody around. Were they waiting to jump out and yell surprise? Had they not heard him come in? Hey guys, Jeremiah said, loud enough for his voice to carry to wherever they were hiding. Thanks, this is, this is really nice. There was no answer, no movement, no sign of anyone being there but him. He walked down the hall to the break area. On the table where the now infamous, infamous hot chip lunch had taken place, a birthday cake sat, looking like he just... Like, looking just like he remembered from childhood, a white frosted grocery store bakery sheet cake trimmed with piped royal blue icing. Happy birthday, Jeremy, was written in blue icing on the top. He smiled. It was close enough. And whoever had put the candles on, Hope, probably, had put on the right number. Maybe he had been wrong about adult birthdays. If someone, especially someone you loved, uh, so, sorry, if someone, especially someone you loved, demonstrated thoughtfulness, then birthdays could be magical at any age. But where was everybody? He walked the rest of the way down the hall, peeking inside empty offices and conference rooms. Maybe they were waiting to jump out when he least expected it. He had to hand it to them. They were doing an awfully good job at hiding. Hope? P Parker? He called. You can come out. You've already surprised me enough. There was no response. Oh my god, what's going to happen? Not knowing what else to do, Jeremiah went to his desk. Maybe they were waiting for him to get deeply immersed in his work. They were going to jump out and surprise him. Jeremiah, I... My. <laughs> I tried to do the echo. The voice was coming from the loudspeaker, which was never used since their office staff had dwindled to, to such a small number. The voice sounded deep and electronic, like when people are interviewed anonymously on TV and don't want anybody to hear their real voice. But there was no doubt in Jeremiah's mind who, had distort who the distorted voice belonged to. He knew that Parker had decided to make him the victim of a birthday prank. He hoped it was a good-natured na prank, at least. Jeremiah, the voice repeated, I have taken your co-workers Parker and Hope hostage. If you call the police, I will kill them immediately. Uh-huh, Jeremiah said, sounding as unconvinced as he felt. The distorted voice was obviously Parker's. You have a choice to make, birthday boy. You can flee the building with the confidence that you will live to see another birthday even though your friends won't, or you can try to save your friends. If you take this option, you have 30 minutes. The longer you take, the worse shape they'll be in when you find them. Now, what is your choice? I choose to save my friends, Jeremiah said with a sigh. In truth, he considered Parker a bully, not a friend. But he wanted to make a good impression on Hope, and triumphing over one of Parker's pranks seemed like a good way to do it. Plus, it was just a stupid game anyway, right? 
like those escape rooms people chose to get themselves locked into so they could have the fun of finding all the clues that they would get that, that would get them out. It was his birthday after all. He might as well play the game. Very well, the distorted voice said. Use your time wisely, or your friends may be missing a few pieces. Your time starts now. Jeremiah stood up. He had to hand it to Parker. This was definitely darker and more imaginative than his usual pranks. He looked around the workroom, trying to find clues. He looked on top of Parker's desk and even pulled the drawers open and looked inside. Nothing out of the ordinary. He went to the reception desk, where Hope usually kept her stuff. Her purse was stored in the usual drawer, which meant she had definitely come in this morning. He wouldn't stoop so low as to invade her privacy by digging through her purse. So Hope was somewhere in the building because her purse was there. And he knew Parker was here because he had heard him on the loudspeaker. To win this game, to beat Parker and oppress Hope, he had to turn himself into a combination of an action hero and a sharp-minded detective. What was it Sherlock Holmes used to say in the stories Jeremiah had liked back in his middle school days? A game is a flute. Uh, oh my god, a flute? It's not a musical instrument. <laughs> the game is a foot. Since you're at a desk, you might as well write something down. The distorted voice over the loudspeaker boomed. Your first clue is an anagram. Write it down. Stinger moot. Um... Two... I don't know. I'm usually quite good at anagrams, but I'm not, not sure. Stinger moot? Jeremiah yelled back at the voice on the loudspeaker, Parker's voice. That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't have to make sense, the voice bellowed. It's an anagram. You're wasting precious time, Jeremiah. Write it down. S-T-I-N-G-E-R space M-O-O-T. Jeremiah did as he was told, but he wasn't going to let Parker intimidate or pressure him. Not this time. He wanted Hope to see the kind of person he really was, that he wasn't just a hapless fool foil for Parker's pranks. Anagrams. It had been a long time since Jeremiah had thought about anagrams. Those were the ones where the letters were scrambled up, weren't they? So he looked at the nonsensical combination of words. If this was truly a clue, then it was probably directing him to a location in the building. He spotted the letters room quickly, so room must be the second word. With those letters eliminated, it didn't take him long to figure out that the remaining letters could be re rearranged to spell testing. Yes, yes. <laughs> just checking, just checking that this uh, book is accurate. The testing room, he said, feeling an undeniable sense of accomplishment. I need to go to the testing room. He walked instead of running. He didn't want Parker to think he was feeling pressured. It was a game after all. Are they trapped in the game? That would be a very cool twist. He used his keycard to open the door to the testing room, then turned on the light. In the middle of the floor sat a small gift box, the size that most often contained jewellery. The little box was wrapped in colourful paper with a shiny purple bow on top. So, this was a birthday treasure hunt with a horror suspense theme? Jeremiah could live with that. At least he could say that his birthday wasn't like every other day. He walked across the room, crouched down, and picked up the small box. He unwrapped it carefully, just in case there might be a clue written on the inside of the wrapping paper. The hinged box was a deep crimson, flocked with velvet, the kind of box that might cradle an engagement ring. He flipped the lid open, his stomach lurched. Teeth. The velvet-lined box was filled with teeth. What? Some large, some perhaps small enough to be baby teeth, one molar was flecked with blood on the bottom, where it had been yanked by the root. Oh my god, that's disgusting. Jeremiah wanted to keep his cool, but couldn't help but visibly shudder. Where had Parker managed to get teeth? Of all things. Was his friends with a, was he friends with a dentist who had a sick sense of humour? Jeremiah took a deep breath. A clue, he told himself. The teeth are supposed to be a clue. Stop freaking out and start thinking. He didn't want to touch the teeth but he knew he needed to examine them for possible clues. He took a tissue from his pocket, spread it over the palm of his left hand and shook the teeth onto the tissue. They contained no distinguishing markings or features. There were seven of them. Could the number be, sp be significant? Seven certainly didn't feel like a lucky number when it referred to a bunch of extracted teeth. He set the teeth aside and examined the box. He pulled out the velvet liner. In the bottom of the box was a small piece of paper that had been folded into a tiny square. 
Jeremiah unfolded the paper. On it, a typed message read, Sink your teeth into this clue, Jeremiah. Give me one, and I'll make more. Each one like the one before. What am I? Fazgu. <laughs> Fazgu. Right? Because there's teeth involved. <laughs> and, and they make replica. Um, I'm joking. It might not be Fazgu, but if it is Fazgu, I am going to scream. Okay? I will scream for you. Jeremiah didn't think to... Uh, sorry. Jeremiah didn't have to think for long. He had always been good at riddles. That's easy, the copying machine. Don't get too confident, Jeremiah. The distorted voice boomed out to the loudspeaker, making him jump. The time is ticking away, only 20 minutes left. And the slower you are, the slower th the more they'll suffer. I wonder, if you do manage to find your friends, will you even be able to recognise them? Oh my god, something actually has happened. Something has happened to their friends, and they've turned into monsters or something. You're really enjoying this, aren't you, Parker? Jeremiah said as he exited the testing room, leaving the teeth behind. Stop nagging me. I'm on my way to the copy room. In no particular hurry, Jeremiah made his way down the dark hallway. The copy room was the third door on the left. When he walked inside, lights from the machine emanated an eerie glow. At first, he went to the machine itself, but found nothing out of the ordinary. He scanned the room. It was small, so there weren't many hiding places. Other than the machine, there was just a wastebasket, a recycling bin, and a long table where people could collate their copies. He looked on the table and saw only the usual office supplies, a cup holding pens and scissors, a stapler, a small jar of paper clips. Wait, those? Those weren't paper clips. They were small, translucent ovals, white-tipped on the top and, and flecked with red on the bottom. What? Fingers! Oh my god! Fingernails! <gasps> fingernails! They're fingernails! And not fingernail clippings, but whole fingernails that had been r r removed somehow. Jeremiah felt the bile rising in his throat. He gagged. He took a deep breath and told himself to calm down. These couldn't be real fingernails. They were props. Extremely realistic props. The kind you'd see in a horror movie with a decent budget. But props nonetheless. He supposed it wouldn't be so outrageous that Parker could get his hands on such things. You could buy anything off the internet these days. But where was the next cute clue? There was nothing else unusual on the table. With a shaky hand, he picked up the jar of fingernails. He appended it, scattering the nails across the table. A small folded piece of paper fell out of the bottom of the jar. He didn't like touching it since it had been in the jar with all those fingernails, but he knew it was the next clue, and he wasn't going to chicken out now. He wouldn't give Parker the satisfaction. He unfolded the slip of paper and read, You nailed this challenge. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Jeremiah could almost hear Parker's annoying he he he. Oh, no, sorry, that was me. <laughs> uh, he kept reading. Your next clue contains even more frights. To get there, you just need to follow the lights. Jeremiah stepped out into the hall. A string of tiny lights was stretched from the doorway of the copy room down the hall. He followed them which was certainly easier than deciphering another cryptic clue. Maybe he was getting close to the end of the game. It hadn't been fun, it was too disturbing for that, but it had been interesting. He would definitely come out of this experience with a story to tell. Times are wasting, Jeremiah, the voice on the, loudest, on the loudspeaker announced. Only ten minutes left. Better get to your friends soon or they'll be all to pieces. The laughter sounded like a distorted version of Parker's hee hee hee. You really put some work into this, Parker. I'll give you that, Jeremiah said. The lights stopped at a doorway to a conference room that hadn't been used since the company's downsizing. He turned the knob and walked in. Sitting on the table, lined up as if staring at him, were three eyeballs. Two of them, Jeremiah noticed, had brown irises. The third one was blue. Oh no. Oh no. Seeing intact eyeballs separated from their owners made Jeremiah think of how delicate the eye was, soft and squishable, like a peeled grape. He felt a wave of nausea, a sensation that was now becoming familiar. These eyes had to be real. Even an excellent special effects artist couldn't make something this convincing. So where was Parker getting this stuff? A thought popped into Jeremiah's head that explained everything. On the third floor of their building was a medical supply company. Jeremiah had never thought that much about what kind of supplies they provided. He had thought scrubs and maybe masks and gloves, that kind of thing. 
But what if they dealt with medical waste? Body parts left over from surgeries that were going to be sent to medical schools for study and dissection. If so, Parker could just have brought some spare parts from them. Jeremiah felt better suddenly, confident that no one had been harmed in the creation of this elaborate prank. He spotted a slip of paper sticking out from under the blue eyeball. He didn't want to touch it, so he nudged it with the blunt end of a ballpoint pen. The eye rolled back, and he grabbed the note and unfolded it. I see that you're moving closer to the goal. Follow the lights to make things right. A new string of lights started at the conference room doorway and led further down the hall. They stopped at the office, which had belonged to the PR, pers PR person before she was laid off. He tried the door and walked inside. A medium-sized gift sat on the desk. It was wrapped in white paper decorated with shiny multicoloured letters spelling Happy Birthday and topped with a big silver bow. Jeremiah was starting to lose the pleasure he had always felt in unwrapping gifts. Still, he tore through the paper and lifted the lid out of the box. Resting inside a nest of light blue tissue paper was a pile of fingers. Maybe maybe as many as 12 or 13, but it was hard to say because many of them had been chopped into fragments. Two of them were missing fingernails. <laughs> that detail is great. Jeremiah couldn't help it. Prank or no prank, he vomited into the wastebasket. Once he was able to normalise his breathing, he looked inside the box again. One of the fingers was small and obviously had belonged to a female. It was wearing a delicate silver ring with a light blue gemstone in it. Aquamarine. Hope's birthstone. <gasps> I, just, I do want to say, obviously you would vomit, because it must smell disgusting if it's real. Like, decaying flesh. <laughs> oh my god. Okay. He realised with horror that it was Hope's ring, the one she always wore on her right ring finger. Did that mean that the severed finger belonged to Hope? He bent over to examine it more closely. There was a small, dark freckle just below the finger's first joint. 